this car doesn't really make any sense. In most practical terms and all the figures, it's demonstrably inferior to other cars which are this size and price. But I've been driving it for three months and it's kind of got under my skin in a good way. So I'm gonna treat this as a therapy session. You can be my doctor. In order to qualify as a doctor, you'll have to like and subscribe to the channel, of course. So please do that first and then we'll talk through my old feelings. So this is a Lexus, which means it's beautifully built and has lots of interesting technology. You also know it will work all the time and that the dealer will be nice to you. That's enough to convince a lot of people, especially those who've previously spent time waiting for a recovery truck, or maybe they've been handed the keys to their £70,000 car in a tent and been told to use Google to see how it works. Well, let me show you some of the bits I really like about this car, because some things are just right. Others are really clever, and some... I'm afraid they're bad enough to make it difficult to recommend the RZ. Let me start with the build quality, in most places at least. It's all ruined by something you have to use every day in the RZ. That's the charging flap. Now, while the rest of it is beautifully built, this thing feels really flimsy. And if you don't get it right in the right place, it doesn't shut and gives you a little warning light on the dashboard top tip, press it down there and it will stay put. But I expect better. I'm also not sure about the black bonnet. A friend of mine cheekily asked if I'd got it from a scrapyard, which would have stung a bit if I'd have paid the £1,100 that it cost for the option. I think it works better on some of the other colours, maybe that nice copper. The doors work electronically rather than mechanically, so you just pull a button to open them, which seems pointless. It's the same on the inside, but it just confuses all your passengers. You have to tell people how they can get out the car, which is not great, really. Thing is, though, I swapped cars with Ginny a couple of weeks ago and found myself begrudgingly having to open a door with a handle in the old-fashioned way, which is weird because even I'm not that lazy. It's a bold-looking car, too, full of curves and slashes. These rear spoiler bits are quite dramatic, too, sort of batmobile -ish. I think they're meant to direct the air to clean the back window, but they don't. Can we just have a wiper instead, like in the old days? Oh, but see this camera? It's got its own little washer, complete with a switch on the wiper stalk. Now, I know other car makers have a clever bit of software, so the camera knows when it's dirty and cleans itself. That would seem simpler. Just one more thing before I show you inside. Bit of a design flaw. So imagine you're in a tight parking spot and you've got a larger belly than normal, then you have to squeeze out. And as you do that, it pulls off this door rubber. A bit broken, sorry. There's also a bit of shiny black plastic in here as well, but it's not quite so easy to look after. It seems to mark really easily and of course, captures all the dust and crumbs too. But on the positive side, I think the screen it's pretty much an ideal size. You have to do this daft thing where you don't agree to something every time you get in. I did try agreeing once and it didn't seem to make any difference to my life. But in the rest of the dashboard, I think it's pretty nice. There's a charging pad for your phone that actually works and seems to keep the phone in place when you're driving around. Cup holders in a sensible place. A very clever little box where I keep my biscuits, which opens that way if you're a passenger and that way if you're a driver. Oh, and the seats and on here, I really like this material. It's so much nicer than normal leather or plastic, but I'm easily swayed. I also really like the displays in this car. The instrument panel has all the info you need. It's got one of the best head-up displays I've ever tried. Really clear, just the right sort of information. And this screen is, I think, the sort of Goldilocks, just perfect size. The buttons aren't so small that you have to operate them with a pair of tweezers. And you've got proper buttons for things like the front screen demister. The heating is also permanently on at the bottom and it's got a really nice automatic function. So we're used to kind of climate control where the temperature of the car inside is kept the same, but this also knows if you're gonna need a heated seat, a heated steering wheel, or these clever infrared heaters that warm your knees. Now, it's quite warm today and I can tell it's the first day of spring because the automatic seat heating has become seat cooling today. Ah, warm weather at last.
These infrared panels are something I haven't seen on any other car, and they're really clever because infrared heats the surface rather than the entire car, thereby saving you energy. Also, infrared is the stuff that gives you suntans, I think, so I'm going to get beach bod ready. So that's ultraviolet, Tom, not infrared. Oh, sorry. If you want the proper sun's rays, then there's this enormous panoramic roof. If it's one of the rare days like today when Britain hasn't made its own clouds, then you can make your own just by pressing this button and it makes the glass panel go opaque. Clever, eh? There's plenty of room in the back, even for my lanky teens, and to stop them moaning, they get their own heated seats, charging ports, and even a 240 volt socket so they can plug in a laptop if they want to. I've got no complaints about the boot either, except for the loud beep when you open it and then close it again. It's loud enough to wake up the neighbours sometimes. When it comes to driving, this car is like the kind of Goldilocks again. It's just about right. The steering feels nice, the brakes feel good, the ride's a little firm but it's not too disruptive and also it's really serene and quiet in here. It's a nice easy car to drive. Now it's four wheel drive, has two motors. The front one's nicked from the Toyota BZ4X so isn't hugely powerful but the back one has more power and it gives a total of 309 horsepower and also a bit of a rear wheel drive feel which is what dynamic drivers of people coming out of BMWs and things like. And the brakes are good too. It's got regen which you can do via these paddles just as simple two taps on that and you get a nice level of not one pedal but decent regen. It would be nice if it remembered it when you turned on the car though. You have to do it each time. It's not a big thing but it's annoying. We have to talk about the bings and bongs as well. Now, these are a legal requirement. I understand that every new car has to have them, but some cars do it better than others. Actually, the lane departure warning on this is quite subtle. The speed limit warning is pretty good. It sees most of the signs and it's not too irritating. It's not too noisy and in your face, but it's got emergency braking and it seems massively oversensitive. Now I live in a village where people park on all sides of the road and you have to pull in. So if you're timing it well, so that you're coming up to a parked car, it will jam on the brakes. And it's quite alarming sometimes, especially if someone's following close behind. Also, if you're parking in a tight space and you've got a post or a pillar or even a hedge on, the, on one side of the car, it will jam on the brakes and you think you've hit something. It's really quite concerning sometimes. But there's a bigger issue that always puts me on edge when I'm driving the RZ and that's the range and the efficiency. Now, this is quite a nice warm day. What we at, it's uh, 14 degrees centigrade and we're about two thirds full and I'm showing 139 miles range. Now, over my three months in various different driving conditions, this car has averaged 2.5 miles per kilowatt hour. Now, I'd be expecting a rival car to be getting at least one mile more out of every kilowatt hour you put in. So that's the equivalent of like a car getting 23 mpg or 33 mpg. It makes a real difference to your life, not just in terms of the range and when you have to stop to charge, but also the cost of it. I've noticed this car costing me more on my electricity bill than the previous cars I've run, some of which have been a similar size. And I can't understand why it's not that efficient. It's an aerodynamic car. Toyota know how to do electric motors and batteries. So what's going on? Is there a parachute that deploys while I'm driving? Am I secretly towing a caravan? Is there a, a, a big group of pixies smelting aluminium in the boot when I'm not looking? I don't know. I just don't understand how they can get that bit quite so wrong. In an attempt to keep efficiency levels up, I drive almost all the time in eco mode, only treating myself to normal if I want the extra aircon. If things get really squeaky, there's a range driving mode which kills the front engine and the heating and gives me another 15 miles or so. Perhaps for this reason, Lexus offer the loan of a hybrid for up to two weeks a year. They'll even deliver and collect it from your house, but you don't get to drink the nice coffee at the dealer then. So thank you, Doctor, for listening to my inner torment about the Lexus RZ450e. I can see it's a nice car. If you're a Lexus driver, this isn't going to feel too alien. It's still got that same build quality. It's nice to drive. And some of the leasing deals that are around at the moment when we did this video mean that that list price doesn't look quite so laughable either. But I stray. I drive other cars and when I do and I see a range meter that has 300 plus on it, I do a little coup of excitement inside and remember what that's like.
because there's nothing luxurious at all about charging all the time. And this Lexus is among the most inefficient electric cars I've ever driven. And I can't work out why. It shouldn't be that way. I know Toyota and Lexus are working on some new technology which will bring all sorts of efficiencies and fast charging. That's going to be great. So if you are a Lexus driver now and want to make the move to electric, I'd suggest just sticking with your hybrid for a couple more years until that new technology arrives. And if you're not a Lexus driver, then maybe look elsewhere until that new technology comes. Sorry, RZ. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for starting, Tom. <laughs>